Hello and welcome to our week three supplemental lecture on Jeffrey Frieden and Ronald Rogowski's Modern Capitalism, Enthusiasts, Opponents and Reformers. This is a long article but it's relatively easy to read because it is written as an introductory survey and it's also written quite recently, it's written after the global financial crisis, looking back at major periods in capitalist economic history and the types of problems that tended to arise, the types of solutions that people tended to pose to those problems, and the oppositional movements that arose in each historical period as well. It is a general introductory survey and will return in more detail to a lot of the themes that they discuss here as we move forward into both our politics and our economics themes later in the term. So they start by saying that capitalism can be characterized by contradictory tendencies, some of which are positive and some of which are negative. Among the positive tendencies, they include extraordinarily high growth rates, things that we've never seen in non-capitalist periods of capitalist history, uh, uh, human history, and an increased productive capacity, uh, the capacity to generate vast amounts of material goods with relatively small amounts of human labor, uh, again to a degree that we've never seen before in history. In terms of the negative tendencies, they talk about inequality within countries and between parts of the world. They talk about a tendency toward crisis. And then as they go through the different stages of capitalist development in this piece, they're going to say that at various points, institutional proposals are put forward that seem to blunt the impact of the crisis tendencies or the inequalities, but that in each case they don't seem fully to stem them. So institutional responses tend to arise, they tend to collapse, and they tend to be rebuilt at different points. And then there are responses in each period. There are people who usually are the beneficiary of the changes and therefore advocate for them. There are opponents often found from among those who lose out. And then there are reformers who are trying to work out some way to hang on to the positive features of capitalism while minimizing the damage that it can do. And they'll trace these across major historical periods. And again, we'll look at all this in greater depth later in the term, but this article provides a good introductory overview. So they start way back in time with mercantilism, a system that they say characterizes the 15th through the 18th centuries. It's a period of European economic and military domination of the world, organized in vast international empires that seek out and maintain colonial possessions. So it's not a period of free trade. It's a period of the direct domination of sections of the world market. And it is oriented to extracting wealth from colonial possessions. However, the accumulation of this wealth ends up spurring the development of larger scale manufacture in the European core that takes the relatively less expensive raw materials coming in from the colonies and adds something to them, transforms them in some ways, and you begin to get new forms of industry. In this particular period, there are government-granted monopolies over particular trade routes, particular industries, over particular colonial resources. When people like Adam Smith, when the founding fathers of classical political economy are ranting about monopolies and ranting about the government, what they're ranting about is this. Okay, so they're neither talking about huge corporations that form because they outcompete everybody else, nor are they talking about governments that are just kind of meddling around at the margins of economic affairs. They're talking about these corporations that are founded solely through a government grant or privilege that have monopoly over a huge chunk of world trade. And you can think about that if you're seeing contemporary discussions about government interference in the market that are citing some of these classical figures, whether the classical figures are actually talking about the same kinds of phenomena that are being talked about today. Then they move to a discussion of the Industrial Revolution, and they give some typical dates for that, 1770s to 1850s. The dates will vary a little bit from work to work. But they characterize it in terms of the rise of the factory system by the beginnings of machine production that starts to de-skill production. So you relied at one point on relatively skilled artisanal laborers. When you get machines into the mix, the people who operate the machines don't require the high level of skill and training and apprenticeship as the skilled artisans that they're replacing. So you get a steady displacement of skilled artisans in favor of an expansion of unskilled labor, relatively unskilled labor. And a system of guilds that have privileges over 
skilled labor of various kinds, start being outcompeted by mass-produced, relatively inexpensive goods that can be produced without the skills the guilds would have relied on. They say that manufacturing interests are the major beneficiaries and supporters, and they talk in particular detail about Britain. Uh, since Marx, it's been taken as kind of the model for capitalist history in this period. And they talk about the ways in which this particular revolution of capital drives, or at least has an affinity with, certain political movements. So parliamentary reforms that are trying to expand representation to include the middle classes, movements to extend the franchise, including movements to extend it to the working classes, and a push for a repeal of tariffs. These get called the Corn Laws, and when you read you'll see people talking about the Corn Laws. It's just a particular kind of tariff that protected the British market and was believed to increase the cost of food. And so it was, and it was also criticized for reducing the demand for Brit British goods overseas as countries would retaliate against the British tariffs with their own tariff. So there was a movement to liberalize trade, to take down the tariff barriers, to stop protecting the industries on the grounds that it would benefit the working classes by lowering the cost of their, of their food, their basic subsistence, but it would also stimulate industry by making it easier to find markets for the products overseas as the domestic market saturated. Elsewhere in Europe, outside of Britain, you get pushes to modernize, rationalize, and standardize laws. You can think a little bit about Foucault in this context. He's tracing this same historical period and some of what he talks about in terms of the rise of disciplinary society and the utilitarian calculus that he discusses is about these modernizing, rationalizing, standardizing moves. And there's also a push to improve infrastructure so that you can facilitate trade over long distances. The center of political gravity, Frieden and Rogowski say, shifts from rural to urban areas and liberalism becomes more influential as a political philosophy. The opponents of these particular changes are often defenders of the traditional industries, people whose livelihood is probably going to be taken away entirely by the development of mechanized production, so farmers, artisans, and guild members. They also talk about intellectuals and artists, particularly those who are influenced by romanticism, which is something that a lot of our readings discussed last week, and the industrial class, the beginnings of the early union movement and also socialist and anarchist movements that are seeking more fundamental social revolutions. Then they talk about what they call modern industrial capitalism from the middle of the 19th century up to World War I. And they argue that there is a convergence of world economies onto what they call the British model. And this model has an endorsement of free trade and the gold standard as the anchors of international economic integration. So you actually have a quite highly integrated, highly globalized world economy in this period that sort of goes away for the bulk of the 20th century and then re-emerges quite suddenly at the end of the 20th century and into the 21st. And there is a, a period sometime around the 90s when, in a sense, we catch up to the level of globalization that already existed back in this 19th century period. So they say there's a general liberalization of trade and integration of countries into the world market and an agreement to exchange currencies for gold at prescribed rates. This period is characterized by very high mobility of finance and very high levels of international migration, and migration not just of the elites, uh, but of populations everywhere, shifting everywhere, following flows of money and following where work is. And they say that it's associated with unprecedented levels of growth. They say, indeed, the world economy grew more in the 75 years from 1840 to 1914 than it had in the previous 750. This period is often characterized as a golden age of capitalism, and it's called the Hundred Years' Peace. And it's very striking because Europe is coming off of a period of hundreds and hundreds of years of war. So in terms of something like the Hirschman piece for this week, where he talks about people having an expectation that trade and capitalism will civilize manners and inaugurate a peaceful period and the rest, it's not a totally ridiculous thing to believe based on the actual empirical experience of this historical period.
So who are the supporters and the opponents of capitalism in this period? Uh, they talk about the primary beneficiaries and supporters being international, financial, commercial, and industrial interests. But they characterize this as a period with a high degree of consensus on what they call an orthodoxy of international trade, even where national interests are hurt by some of these commitments. And they say, this orthodoxy privileged a country's international economic relations even at the expense of some national concerns. The consensus included a commitment to the gold standard, to respect for cross-border property rights, strong involvement in international commerce, and in most cases free migration of persons. In the developed nations of Europe and North America, this consensus was embraced by most economic and political leaders, as well as by large portions of the middle classes, and even among workers, especially ones whose livelihoods were closely tied to international trade and investment. They talk about the fact that European labor movements would sometimes support trade liberalization because it lowered the cost of basic goods and therefore effectively increased the real wages of workers, and also it offered the possibility for jobs servicing foreign markets. Okay, so there's not necessarily a conflict between labor and capital in all industries around the issue of trade liberalization. They say the commitment to the orthodox consensus is more limited in the periphery. There's an internationalist elite and it's highly influential, but there are also more concerns in the periphery about whether this benefits their economies to the same degree that it does the core. Nevertheless, they say the goal was full participation, even if you have some countries dropping in and out of the gold standard, and by the early 1900s, all major economies except China and Persia were on the gold standard. Okay, so it's, it's a high attunement, a high consistency of national institutions necessary to participate in a particular international institution. It's historically very unusual. However, what you also have in this period are experiments with forms of what they call statism. Okay, so more centralized, less democratic forms of state control that are nevertheless still trying to facilitate capitalist development. And what drives this, they say, are fears of social disruption caused by the free market. We've talked about some of these fears looking at classical social theories in this period. They call the group of folks who support statism conservative modernizers. And they seek to use strong states to minimize disruption while retaining the industrial and financial power of capitalism. They say, in short, the conservative modernizers constructed a powerful state that accelerated capitalist development, sheltered the most threatened traditional sectors, and provided extensive social benefits, but opposed democracy. So the sorts of political forms that happened in Britain were resisted or overturned in various parts of the world in favor of a statist compromise. And these sort of statist moves are strengthened by the 1840 eight uprisings, we discussed these in the social movements lecture this week, um, which did provoke a general reaction and a fear that if states weren't more powerful and weren't sitting on top of working class discontent more effectively, you were going to have a range of revolutionary movements all across the world. These reactions are partially repressive, but they are also partially meant to satisfy some of the demands of working class and other sorts of oppositional movements, and so to diffuse some of the satisfaction. And they take Bismarck as an example and go into some detail about Bismarck's reforms. They talk about the way in which he reintroduces some guilds, the ones that are not regarded as contradictory to the character of capitalism, things like pharmacies and things like that that he allows some local monopolies and tariffs to protect local industry, provides subsidies for research and development, and these subsidies are effective. They, they spark innovations that are quite important in the economic development of this area. And you have the first social insurance system. So it's a major attempt to pacify working class uh, political movements by providing an old age pension and other kinds of supports that uh, improve the conditions for the working classes so that they won't overthrow the state in order to gain better conditions. And this is obviously a model that on that level spreads. And they say it's a system of state-led capitalism that in its time generated a faster growth rate than elsewhere in Europe. So it's not ineffective 
Then they talk about progressives and reformers during this period. There's a reaction to inequality and poverty, and also the fear of a working class revolution if these things are not addressed. And many of these progressives and reformers don't want to go in the full direction of the statist response, but they try to combine democratic forms of political governance with state regulation of industry. So you get a raft of anti-monopoly regulations, health and safety regulations, working hours and conditions becoming regulated, and improvements in various amenities in working class neighborhoods and in housing. Okay, so the beginnings of things that start looking like what we know as the welfare state coming out of this period. And then you have a reactionary response. You have the beginnings of fascism. And they say that in this period it's actually quite weak. It's not going to be until World War I and its aftermath that the fascists get a serious hold. But it is a rejection of market economies and together with them cosmopolitanism. And we'll revisit cosmopolitanism as a concept later in the term. It appeals to elements of a pre-capitalist order and voices some of its critiques in terms of anti-Semitism. And they say to many of these groups, the threat of a new, unfamiliar and more competitive world, and especially of a world market, could be attributed to one especially cosmopolitan group, namely Jews. So it is a critique of capitalism that blames the features of capitalism on a particular group that doesn't have a national home that is forced to be mobile, that is often visibly associated with particular elements of capitalism, uh, and then comes to be blamed for the system. And then socialism. And in this period, socialism is looking like it will be triumphant. It is progressing, it is making gains through legal means rather than through revolutionary overthrow. It's rising in its influence in representation in governments all across Europe. And in some places it's getting quite high representation. And it has a great deal of strength because it combines the influence it has through labor organizing with electoral mobilization. Okay, it is, this point is oriented to the reform of the capitalist system, but driven by the belief that that reform was gradually going to lead to an eventual overthrow or a phasing out of capitalism, and that this was an inevitable process. But in the interim, what you do is you implement partial steps toward that goal through the traditional parliamentary measures. And Friedman Rogowski say some of the most theoretically consistent internationally unified and extreme opponents of the ca classical capitalist order seem to have arrived at the gates of the fortress whose defenders were in any event thinning rapidly and often enough on the verge of panic. Okay, so if you're sitting in this period looking toward the future, you probably think that future is going to be socialist. Okay, and this continues up through a much later historical period. You can see it in the Schumpeter piece, which is written in the early 1940s. This idea that there is a linear trajectory towards socialism is quite compelling across a long period of European history. They then step back a little bit, but only a very little bit. The article is not particularly strong in what's going on outside the core, but they talk a little bit about the periphery in this same period. So who are the supporters outside the core of the kinds of capitalism that are dominant in this period? Uh, they tend to be British colonies or ex-colonies that are just replicating the British model where they are, or other colonies or semi-capitalist economies that benefit from access to the European markets. So by accepting the consensus about the conduct of your national economic affairs that gets you the ticket to the international market, you gain access to European markets that may be quite important for your local industries. And then they highlight China and India as particular critics. India, because it is for various reasons not really properly allowed to integrate internationally. Uh, it's maintained as a sort of captive market for British goods. And China, because of concerns that full integration with the international market are going to undermine local political authority. They don't talk much about World War I. Uh, we'll read some people who'll talk much more about it and its impact when we move into our economics topic later in the term. But they do mark World War I as a turning point. It shatters international integration, certainly for the period of the war. And they note that although there's substantial support after the war for trying to get back to the pre-war consensus, 
it just doesn't happen. There are meetings and negotiations and attempts to get something together, and then the Great Depression happens, and it just sort of destroys any momentum that there would have been. But what you see in this period between the wars is the rise of much more extreme alternatives to capitalism. So you don't have solely a kind of a moderate, successful, legally operating socialist initiative that's working inside the electoral process. You have fascism that is reacting in Germany to the damage from the war, the burden of, of reparations that were imposed on Germany after World War I. Uh, there's a threat and a great deal of fear from the Bolshevik Revolution and what that's going to mean for the future of sort of local states and economies. And fascism has a complicated relationship to capitalism. Uh, it's willing to collaborate with industrial firms, but it also nationalizes firms that get in the way. And it does make economic policy decisions that have to do with its anti-modernist ideals, even where those policy decisions are not strictly economically efficient or rational. So fascism building in this period. And communism. Uh, sparked again by the Bolshevik Revolution, groups that are inside and outside the Soviet area, splitting off from reformers. It causes a divide in the socialist movement between people who want to continue working gradually within existing political systems and people who think we now have an effective model for revolutionary overthrow and that that's something that we should action uh, everywhere. These movements have relatively limited success in the core, but they are more appealing to countries on the periphery. And then they move into something they call contemporary capitalism. This isn't quite how most people would characterize this. They're talking about the period from post-World War II implicitly until now. Most people will carve this up a little differently, post-World War II up to around uh, 68 or sometime in the 70s, and then they'll talk about a more recent organization of capitalism. But they talk about a structure for the international economy that emerges through an explicit negotiated agreement at a place called Bretton Woods. And you'll read texts as we go through the course that are just casually referring to Bretton Woods. The place name is used as a shorthand for this collection of agreements. And they're going to summarize what the contents of those here. This is where we start getting a lot of institutions that are still familiar to us today as being the major institutions for navigating our international economic terrain. They talk about Bretton Woods as an organized and planned attempt to reconstitute a functioning, relatively open, international capitalist system, the system that was broken apart by the two world wars. And so it's a series of multilateral agreements, lots of different countries participating and negotiating. And it establishes a series of institutions. Uh, some of them relate to trade. Uh, the organization that we now know as the World Trade Organization, the WTO, is a successor organization to something called the GATT that is formed in this period. Uh, it seeks to liberalize trade, minimize tariffs, but it allows broad areas for countries to exempt sensitive parts of their industry. So it's softly, softly, tentatively, tentatively, but aiming to get back to a more fully integrated world market. Uh, monetary and financial relations, and they talk here about the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, uh, which institutes a kind of modified gold standard where other countries' uh, currencies are pegged to the US dollar. And in this arrangement, the US has far less flexibility than the other countries, which is one of the reasons for this particular system to collapse as the US economy begins to suffer in the late 60s and early 70s. And then institutions related to development, so the World Bank, uh, which is trying to cultivate investment interest in the developing world. This series of negotiated arrangements, uh, combined with the fact that there's an enormous push to an enormous demand for industry to help Europe sort of recover after World War II, inaugurates a period of really rapid economic growth. It's another one of these periods that's sometimes called the golden age of capitalism, although they don't use that term in this article. They say that the success of this system actually made it very hard to sustain. Greater international integration creates huge pressures on countries that start losing the ability to control their national policies. And a little later in the term, when we look at Keynesianism, we'll see that some of the Keynesian tools, the idea that the state intervenes in its own kind of bounded national economy, 
those sorts of Keynesian tools start becoming less and less effective, and international economic integration is one of those reasons. And then the monetary compromise around pegging currencies to the US dollar collapses in the early 1970s as the US is beginning to suffer from the consequences of these agreements. And it comes to be replaced by floating exchange rates and other compromises associated with the system begin to unravel. Nevertheless, what Bretton Woods does is it leaves behind itself a much more integrated economy than existed right at the end of World War II. Through this period, the international economy associated with Bretton Woods, associated with capitalism, is only part of the world. And you've got an opposing international system that is centered on the Soviet bloc, uh, that focuses on central planning and price controls and investment in a heavy industry at the expense of consumer goods. And it also sees really rapid growth immediately following World War II. So it's not immediately apparent which of these two systems is going to generate a better economic alternative. Uh, in some ways, the Soviet system probably looked for a brief period as though it was going to be able to grow faster because it took a while to get the systems in place for what was going on with economic integration internationally in the West. And then there's a falling off. And when you get a falling off, when, things, when growth rates begin to decline, there are movements toward market reforms in many communist countries. Uh, and the Soviet Union's reforms halt because the government collapses as a whole. Okay, so the system comes down. The developing world is also largely thrown back on its own resources because of the two world wars. So during the two world wars and in the interim between them, there's not a, as much of an international market because of the instability caused by the wars themselves. The terms of trade, when trade can be negotiated, are often disadvantageous. And so you get movements for local industrialization protected by tariffs or outright nationalization or subsidies, uh, attempts to create what are called autarkic economies, economies that are self-sufficient, that don't have to interact with the world at large. And you get the development of theories, and we'll look at some of these later in the term, that capitalism is structurally biased against poor countries. It's, it's called dependency theory, and we'll take a look at that in both the political and economic topics. You begin to get structural crises in these autarkic areas in the mid-1980s. You get substantial debt crises. And you get a groundswell of new sympathy for integration with the international economy. And you also get quite a lot of outside pressure to integrate. So the condition of assistance from international economic institutions is often that countries reform their economies to conform to an international consensus. And they use the term Washington consensus to reflect that. So past the period of Bretton Woods, uh, you get a burst of innovation, you get a rapid rise of productivity, you have rising international economic integration that opens markets all over the world, and you get a new orthodoxy that emerges, uh, sort of, that has its differences from the orthodoxy of the 19th century, but a similar kind of compellingness to it while it's transcendent. And Friedman and Rogowski say it is a distillation of what the IMF, the World Bank, the US Treasury, and developed world bankers and officials more generally saw as the magic formula for economic growth. You can tell in the tone, in the words they're using, that something's going to go wrong with this magic formula. But we'll take a look at the Washington Consensus and some of the documents that summarize what it is later in the term. But they summarize it as a commitment to open trade and investment public debt only for infrastructure development or primarily for infrastructure development or other productive uses of public debt. So you don't go into public debt to uh, increase the well-being of members of your population. You go into productive debt because you're going to get some return on the investment for that debt. They say a realistic, perhaps even undervalued exchange rate. Public spending primarily on human and physical capital. So again, frowning on short-term spending that is intended to offset immediate economic downturn and more on long-term investment. Moderate tax rates, privatization, and the abolition of restricted regulation. And this should all be sounding pretty familiar to us. This is stuff that's happened in the last several years, uh, that's still been in the news, that is still influential, so it should be in living memory for most of you taking this course. 
and they say the consensus spawned zealots. In this case, believers in perfectly efficient markets, perfectly rational actors, deregulation that compromised even prudential supervision of banks or elementary guarantees of public safety. The markets could only shower blessings on mankind. Okay, so again, there's a dripping with sarcasm element to how they're talking about the Washington Consensus, and you can guess from the language that they're using that something's going to go wrong with this. And then they carry us to the present, and the title of the section is Global Financial Crisis 2007 to... We don't know. And they say, this time indeed was different, as in when the architects of the Washington Consensus articulated what they were saying. They thought they had the institutions that had capitalism solved. This time it was different, except that it wasn't. Okay, and the article concludes saying, we still have capitalism with the same pros and cons that it's always had. We still don't have an institutional solution, and we're still looking for one. And we'll come back to all of these when we get to our uh, economic concepts in uh, weeks 9 and 10.